Right now, deadly floodwaters wash over the Midwest as states seek help from the devastation. Plus, Minnesota's drug sentencing guidelines under scrutiny. And there's growing recognition that we're locking up too many addicts. Tonight, what changes we could see in the new year. And a rush for enhanced driver's licenses leads to long lines at the DMV. Just want to be able to make sure I can travel in 2016. The news at 10 starts now. Thanks for joining us. Minnesota's standoff with the federal government has DMVs dealing with long lines leading up to the new year. Minnesota is one of several states that hasn't complied with the Real ID Act, which would add new security measures to licenses. Jay Olsted is here to explain why there's a rush on enhanced IDs. Hi, Jay. Hi, Camille. Yeah, those enhanced driver's license meet federal standards. And so with a potential deadline looming, there's a lot of people out there trying to get their hands on one. Is this a consistent thing today? And she's like, yeah, it has been nonstop. That's what Trace Ludwig discovered yesterday when he tried to get a Minnesota enhanced driver's license in Anoka. I think that people are just a little concerned and they want to make sure that they're able to travel. He waited 45 minutes to sign up. And he's not alone. A number of people told us on Facebook and Twitter they waited in long lines to do the same recently. Not to mention state numbers show an increase in demand too. Since February 2014, the DMV says it issued on average nearly 700 enhanced licenses a month. But in just the first 18 days of December, it reports handing out more than 3,000. Just want to be able to make sure I can travel in 2016. Right now, Minnesota is one of a handful of states not compliant with ID federal standards, which means Minnesotans may not be able to use their traditional driver's license to get on a plane next year. However, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security says it would give at least 120 days notice before anything's changed, which hasn't happened yet. An enhanced driver's license, which meets federal standards, allows people to cross both the Canadian and Mexican borders without a passport. It was kind of confusing. Chase says you need a lot more documentation to get an enhanced driver's license. He needed a picture ID, his social security card, birth certificate, and proof of address. Despite all that, he says... It's worth it. I think in the end, you know, when I want to travel, I'm not going to have to worry about this as I get into the new year. Now, if you go to care11.com, we put more information on the enhanced driver's license process, specifically what you need to get one and where you can find one. All that, again, at care11.com. Camille? All right. Well, thank you, Jay. New at 10, the Department of Human Services plans to take action on issues at the state operated psychiatric hospital in Anoka. Commissioner Emily Johnson Piper cited problems with patient safety, staff injuries and overtime found during a recent review by the centers and Medicare and Medicaid services. Piper plans to bring in outside experts to come up with short and long term solutions. A Minnesota panel has approved a plan to overhaul the state's drug sentencing guidelines, which would ease penalties for drug possession and dealing. John Croman joins us with the decision, which has been years in the making. Hi, John. Hey, Camille. What we saw today in St. Paul was an effort by the Sentencing Guidelines Commission to separate those who use drugs from those who sell them and also make an effort to deal with drug addicts more humanely. The guidelines created by this commission serve as a playbook for judges across the state. They've decided to give courts more leeway when it comes to drug cases. We think that a drug dealer is more culpable uh, than a drug user. State Supreme Court Justice Chris Dietzen chairs the panel. We want the drug user who wants to get better to go into treatment. Currently, first-degree drug possession and first-degree drug sale are treated the same. Both carry a presumptive sentence of seven years. The commission voted to drop first-degree possession to four years and reduce first-degree sales to five years. And being addicted will qualify a person for treatment instead of prison. And there's growing recognition that we're locking up too many addicts. Uh, people who are addicted to drugs um, are, end up in prison and that doesn't serve public safety or doesn't get them on a road to recovery either. One goal is to ease prison overcrowding. 
Minnesota's overall inmate population has grown 84 percent in the past 20 years, but the number of drug offenders sent to prison grew twice as fast, 171 percent. The projection is this will save over 500 prison beds over 10 years. Some aren't happy with the idea of reduced sentences for anyone who sells drugs. But the problem that I have as a prosecutor is sending a message that we are reducing sentences for those who are profiting from the addiction of others, those who are perpetuating the addiction of others. Now, prosecutors didn't come away empty handed today. The commission also added new aggravating factors that will double sentences for those caught dealing drugs in multiple counties in Minnesota and people dealing drugs while armed. Back to you. All right. Well, thank you, John. Now, Minnesota Attorney General Lori Swanson says a convicted Medicaid fraudster is at it again. 51 year old Barbara Curran is in the Shakopee Women's Prison for a 2010 fraud conviction. Now, Swanson says Curran and six others have been defrauding taxpayers for $2.6 million in false medical assistant building billings. Now, Curran conspired with family members and friends to create eight different nursing agencies whose operations she directed that then build medical assistance for these nursing services, despite the fact that she was banned from being involved. Swanson says oftentimes Medicaid was billed for services that were never provided to patients, many of whom were unaware of the fraud. A Richfield police officer will not face any charges after a Twitter video showed him pushing and hitting a teenager. Video from the October incident shows the officer trying to get 19 year old Kamal Jelly to leave Adams Hill Park. The Hennepin County Attorney's Office said the investigation did not meet the requirement for felony charges. A special prosecutor for the city also reviewed the case and did not pursue charges. A spokesperson for a victim's family says that they are upset with the decision. In overall, uh, the community and the family is not happy with the, the way things are going and the outcome of this procedure. Uh, but we will continue talking to the police on the city of Richfield uh, to, to at least bring this case into closure. Jamal says Jelly intends to file a civil lawsuit against the Richfield Police Department. A Minneapolis City Council member is standing by tweets she sent last week, which included personal information of constituents who were critical of her participation in a Black Lives Matter protest. Carol Levin's Jana Shortle talked with her today. Is to help us. As a freshman city councilwoman, Alondra Cano has ground rules for herself. One of them, she says, is to talk about the issues very publicly. Well, she did that last week while she was at a rally supporting the Black Lives Matter movement at the Mall of America. While she was there, she went to her public Twitter page. I did not break any uh, any laws. Um, I did not break any rules. Um, my intention was not to uh, put anyone in harm's way. Um, what I was doing is um, keeping a public conversation public. Cadeau posted four separate emails on Twitter sent to her official Minneapolis account to disagree with those senders criticizing her for going to the Black Lives Matter protest. When she posted them, she included the senders' names addresses and phone numbers. Immediately, she was chastised online. Accusers said she was out of line. No, I wasn't trying to shame anyone. I wasn't trying to punish anyone. My goal was really to continue this public conversation using the social media platforms that I regularly use to engage young people, to engage voters of color, to engage a new generation in democracy building. Within hours, Cano took down the tweets. She said today, because the online discussion became hateful towards her, even threatening. One calling for her removal by office by militia, many others threatening her safety. And I can't pretend that you don't let it uh, impact you. Of course, I have three young children and I'm worried about them. Uh, but this is the kind of um, intimidation and threats and attacks that are very common to people of color who are taking on issues of social justice. So now, a week later, Cano says, no regrets and no apologies, and that she welcomes anyone to engage her on the issues. And I want to have this public discussion. I, I, I think it's important for us to create those spaces of engagement, and that's what I was doing through my actions, is creating more opportunities for engagement. Jenna Shortle, Carol 11 News. In terms of the ethics complaint filed against her, she says she does not know what it is exactly. A spokesperson from the city of Minneapolis also could not say if it is directly related to the councilwoman's Twitter posts. 
There's a whole new list of laws going into effect in just two days. Starting January 1st, drivers must show proof of insurance when they renew their vehicle registration. Nonprofit hospitals will have to tell patients about financial assistance policies before they send bills to collection. And a new law will extend health benefits to the families of volunteer firefighters killed on duty. A pack of cigarettes in Minnesota will cost more in the new year as well. Ten cents will be added to the price of a pack to cover the cigarette tax. And an extra two cents will cover a hike in sales tax for a pack. That's an overall increase of 12 cents. Advocates say even a small jump can give smokers the incentive to quit. If you have a choice between a pack of cigarettes and a meal, you're going to go for the meal. And that's what this is all about. If you want to quit in the new year, Quit Plan Services of Minnesota offers, offers free services, including starter kits, which provides a two-week supply of nicotine patches. 670 Minneapolis vehicle owners and another 476 in St. Paul found themselves without a ride today. They were towed during the snow emergency last night, which are still in effect. We're getting a break from the snow, but temps are dropping. Jeff Edmondson is in the backyard now with a first look. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Camille. Yeah, there's no real big snow coming down right now. A few flurries, though, did come down earlier here in the backyard. There's just a very light dusting of snow. You can see that up here on radar here. It's just to the east of the Twin Cities Metro. This area of snow is going to continue moving east here over the next little bit. So areas into Wisconsin, you'll see some of these light snow showers coming down. I'm not expecting much more than dusting, though, from this. Our temperatures are sitting in the teens right now, but as we look ahead to overnight, ugh, look at how cold it gets on those numbers there, especially in southern Minnesota where we see one degree for that temperature in Mankato tomorrow morning. Why? Because of the clearing skies. We'll see clearing skies likely overnight tonight, and that's going to allow for kind of a cold start tomorrow morning with single digits likely in many areas. But we'll also have a mix of sunshine and clouds tomorrow. This is really going with a lot of sunshine, but I believe we'll see some more clouds tomorrow afternoon. But we do have some cold temperatures as you see for tonight, Camille, but into tomorrow, warming up a little bit more, warming up as we go into the weekend. We'll talk about how warm we'll get by this weekend in just a little bit. All right, looking forward to it. Thanks, Jeff. Now still ahead at 10, a renewed call for help in the nation's midsection as states deal with rare December flooding. We'll take a look at the new devastation in Missouri as the president pledges help for victims. And in tonight's Take Care of Your Money, good news for Minnesota's housing market in 2016. Stay with us. Twenty sixteen could be another good one for the Twin Cities housing market. A St. Thomas University study shows the median price of homes sold here could increase by up to eight percent. And the number of sold homes will likely grow up to six percent. Consumer Reports is out with its list of most beloved and hated vehicles this January, surveying which models are the most satisfying among drivers. The heavy favorite was the Tesla Model S. It's followed by the Chevy Corvette and three different Porsche models. As for the most disliked cars, the Kia Rio tops the list, followed by the Nissan Sentra and the Jeep Compass and Patriot. Weight Watchers shares are soaring as TV commercial starring Oprah Winfrey hits the airwaves this new year. She tweeted the ad to her more than 30 million followers yesterday. Weight Watchers stock has more than tripled since October when Winfrey brought, bought a 10% stake in the company. Well, chilly night tonight, Jeff, out there, but, you know, even a little dusting of snow we saw today, right? Yeah, a little bonus snow here. Not much, though, not even enough to grab the broom and sweep it just because it's not going to be much of a covering for at least the Twin Cities tonight. Some areas south may see a little bit more, but it's part of a little weak batch of energy that's moving through, which is not part of the bigger storm system that's hitting the East Coast, just kind of a little weak one here. The big one that's hitting the East Coast right now, you can still see all of that rainfall that's falling on the East Coast around the spots on North Carolina near the Outer Banks of North Carolina, New York as well. And north of New York, there's also a zone 
of snow that's falling too, and that's moving into Maine. But we're not seeing the big storm system, so we're just seeing little light waves of energy kind of drift by and move through our area, which is keeping us still cloudy tonight, but not for that much longer. Once again, here's that area of snow right here. You can see it around Red Wing right now and also moving into Wisconsin near Baldwin. Rice Lake, you'll probably see some of these flurries here within the hour, but nothing really all too severe or heavy with it though, so it's not a big deal. 19 degrees is our temperature now. Wind chill is down to 8. There's no wind here in the backyard. I still feel pretty good, but I think by tomorrow though, it's going to be that kind of time where it's time to switch into more a little bit colder clothes or stuff that'll keep you a little bit warmer because it is going to be pretty chilly tomorrow with the wind and also the actual temperature bringing that wind chill down to be pretty cold. So right now we're at 19 degrees in the Twin Cities, 11 degrees in St. Cloud. You can see across the country, the colder air right here, and it's just starting to drift into our area. So that's going to affect our temperatures for most of tomorrow across our region. The only warm spots right now are well down to the south, Atlanta at 59, but you have to go further south of that front towards Florida, and that's where the tropical air is. And this is where it should be this time of year. But you remember last week when you saw in the newscasts about the warm air that was sitting across the East Coast, how New York had temperatures in the 70s for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day? Well, that warm air now is finally shifted off to the east, but it's not really gone yet. It hasn't disappeared. It's still sitting out over the central Atlantic right now. So look at this. You see these clouds right here that are drifting from the west to the east over the ocean, and then they kind of swing up towards the north, towards the North Pole. That's the flow that's happening right now. So there's all of this tropical air basically being sucked right in towards the top of the globe, towards the North Pole, and we're seeing temperatures way above normal, actually setting records. There hasn't been a record, or a temperature rather, above freezing there in a long time, and some spots have not even seen the temperature above freezing ever recorded since the 40s when they started measuring temperatures at the North Pole. Normally it's around 20 below, now it's around 33 degrees. And hey, it's warmer at the North Pole than it is in the Twin Cities. How many times can you say that in the wintertime? I don't even know if you can count that on your hand. That's, that's pretty rare. Amazing. So for tonight, we're just seeing the cloud cover across our area. Not really much happening. As we go into tomorrow, we'll probably see highs right around 18 degrees across our area. Still looking at cloud cover lingering a bit tomorrow. But we'll also have more sunshine then as we look forward to New Year's Day, which is on Friday. So highs will be in the teens tomorrow, 20s then on Friday. Saturday, we're looking at a high of 31 degrees, mostly sunny starting on Friday. So as we begin the new year, we'll have a nice bright and sunny start to the weekend and also into next week. Maybe some snow into next week on Wednesday, Camille. Right now, no big snow events, though, besides that one for next week. So we're looking pretty dry for the weekend. And looking really quiet. All right. Thank yeah. you, Jack. Thanks. Well, Missouri transportation officials are preparing for the possible closure of a major interstate highway south of St. Louis because of flooding. I-55 at the Merrimack River could close overnight or sometime tomorrow. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers says high water from the Mississippi River and its tributaries has spilled over nine federal levees. Eleven others still face possible significant distress. We are here before the water rises, we're here after it falls. We're here until this place is back to where it was before. And sometimes that takes a while. Illinois' governor is returning early from a vacation to visit flood damaged areas. And President Barack Obama is pledging the federal government's help in recovery efforts. Coming up in sports, a Minnesota native reflects on his rookie year in the NFL, plus trouble for the Gophers men's basketball team as they start conference play. Kirk has highlights next. Carol Evans Sports from the Renters Warehouse Sports Desk. Well, things didn't go the way they usually do in the non conference schedule for the Gopher men's basketball team, but tonight, the clean slate starts as the Big Ten season commences. Minnesota at Ohio State, Carlos Morris knocking down the three, ties this one up at 37 early in the second half. Gover's digging out of a hole. He scores 18, by the way, for the Maroon and Gold. Later, it's the nice drive and left-handed lay-in by Nate Mason. Cuts the lead to one. He adds 10 points on the evening, but Ohio State goes on a 21-5 run, including this David Bell slam as they put it away by 15. 
in the conference opener. Sam Mitchell squad hosting the Jazz at Target Center. Carl Anthony Towns finding Andrew Wiggins for a one-handed slam as the Wolves extend their lead to 10 in the second half. 25 points tonight for Cat. Later, it's Wiggins finding Towns underneath for the easy hoop, and the Wolves defeat the Jazz, a rare home victory tonight. 94 to 80 will take it. That snaps a four-game losing streak. The final week of the regular season is always time for reflection. Highs and lows, ups and downs, common in the NFL. And former Egan standout Zach Zenner's rookie year with the Lions was no exception. Ryan Shaver has the story. In a game as violent as football, things can change with just one hit. Something Lions running back Zach Zenner knows all too well. To have an end so suddenly, um, it's, that's the hardest pill to swallow. Four fractured ribs and a partially collapsed lung. You just couldn't take a full deep breath. Brought Zenner's promising rookie season to a close back in week six, just when it was starting to pick up steam. To be able to work my way into a contributing role, you know, on special teams and offense was uh, special. After leading the league in rushing during the preseason, Zenner went from long shot to make the team to starting running back by week five. An improbable ascent for most guys, but for Zenner, it's been a career of proving people wrong. You can't let the good pump you up too much, and you can't let the bad drag you down. It's that level-headed approach that helped make Zenner a two-way star at Egan High School. I loved playing there, and I know I had a great team, great teammates. But as great as he was, the big colleges didn't come a knocking. So instead, Zenner took a scholarship to South Dakota State, where he put together three straight seasons of over 1,800 yards. But when it came time for the NFL draft, Zenner's name was never called. I guess, you know, to be here now, it's been a really a crazy journey. See him getting up kind of slow here. A journey Zenner will continue next season, healthy and motivated as ever. In Detroit, Ryan Shaver, CARE 11 Sports. And of course, this weekend, it's time to embrace the cheese. I will admit, I've made the trek to Lambeau many, many times. And while they may be obnoxious and certainly the foils to so many of us Minnesotans, and yes, entirely too easy a target to poke fun at, the bottom line is that these are some of, if not the most impassioned fans in all of pro sports. So bring it on, Packers fans. We will meet again on your green and gold title town turf and you'll be able to catch our live coverage starting on Saturday and the game, of course, on CARE 11 on Sunday night. That's sports. CARE 11 News back after this. Before we go, a grassroots event lifted up the spirits of police officers in Oakdale tonight. The Back the Badge campaign had residents of the Hadley Hills neighborhood watch setting up an impromptu coffee shop. On and off duty officers were asked to stop by for a hot cup of java or cocoa as well as a holiday snack. Oakdale's very strong in their community policing and we feel part of the team so we wanted to just take the time to say thank you. It's truly all about a big thank you for the job that they do day in and day out. The neighborhood also displayed yard signs, ribbons on the trees, and blue light bulbs on their homes as a show of support for law enforcement. That is so great, you know, to see it, see all that support out there for those guys who put their lives on the line every night. For yep, us. definitely. So, great for the community. All right, thanks for joining us. We'll see you in the morning on Sunrise.